to The Breakdown with Brock and Becky, a weekly podcast that breaks down politics, policy, and current affairs. I'm Michael Brockhorp. And I'm Becky Scher. We are back in studio today with a great guest. Last week, we had a good time recapping some recent events on the podcast, but this week, we're back to our regularly scheduled programming with a guest here in studio with us. Today, we are excited to be joined by Anna Matthews, the Executive Director of the Republican Party of Minnesota. Anna joined the state party back in August following her time working for Congressman Tom Emmer. Today, we're going to break down why Anna stepped into this role and why she believes in Chairman Han's ability to lead the party. We're going to further break down the role of the party, officers and staff, and some common misconceptions or mistruths that are often spread. We're also going to continue our recent discussion of the State Central Committee meeting and Anna's take on the Republican Party of Minnesota's path forward. We will end by breaking down the upcoming caucus night in February, as well as the presidential primary in March. Becky and I will end the show by hitting on this week's Pick'em League and a glimpse of hope for Becky that's really not there. Thank you for joining us, and we hope you enjoy the show. Well, we are very excited to be back in person for an interview today with Anna Matthews. So, Anna, you have been over at the state party as executive director for about five five months. months. All right. So uh, I'd like you to just share a little bit about your background and why you decided to take this job on. So I started, and thank you for having me, by the way, Becky and Michael, thank you. I started getting involved in politics uh, when I was in college. I joined the College Republicans. At that time, I was an education major, and I uh, was taking one political science class because I wanted to double major in secondary ed and social studies, social sciences, whatever they call it. And um, I went down to the Iowa caucuses. And it was a lot of fun, um, and I kind of caught the bug there. Uh, went down, came back uh, that spring, ended up switching my major over to political science, and um, really didn't look back. I um, did a couple of political internships when I was in college. I interned for Jason Lewis up here in Minnesota. I interned for Congresswoman Lynn Jenkins down in Kansas, who has since uh, left the House. Um, and then I also um, interned and later worked at a nonprofit that did some different communications things, you know, online blogs, magazines. Um, they've done some different education initiatives. Um, and then from that point, I went to work for Tom Emmer full time and uh, did some uh, work with his fundraiser, did a lot of grassroots work, was involved in their digital fundraising program, just really all aspects of the campaign. Um, then I was sent back down to Kansas uh, with Tom being the NRCC chair. There was a, a nationally targeted district, uh, third district on the Kansas side, um, and they needed a campaign manager. And so I went down for the 2022 year and managed uh, that campaign. And that was a lot of fun. Um, came back to Minnesota uh, December of 2022, and everybody was so dejected. I came home and everybody was just so dejected that they had just lost. But I was actually kind of energized. And I think part of it was because I hadn't lived through it, right? I hadn't personally suffered this crushing defeat. But we came so close. I mean, we lost two statewide races by less than a point. We lost the Senate by one seat, the House by only a few seats. And I just looked around and I just thought there is so much opportunity here. And we are closing the gap and we are making progress. And it just it became so apparent, you know, all the things that I think operatives have talked about for years. I'm sure that you've thought about some of this stuff, Michael. I'm sure that you've thought about some of this stuff, too. If we could only check the basic fundamental boxes of politicking, of campaigning, we could make huge gains in this state. And we just came so close. And so that's why I took the job, because I see what we can do. And I see that we're only, you know, 0.34% and 0.8% away from getting there. Like, if this is not some pipe dream. Like, we are literally right on the edge. I I love that. I love the optimism. I love the hopefulness. I think Michael and I have talked quite a bit about, um, you know, working in this for, uh, in, in Minnesota Republican politics for a little over a decade. It's very easy to be disillusioned and mm-hmm. to kind of focus on those negatives. But it isn't, it is a good reminder of how close things are and the opportunity that does exist. So I think that is great that you are in a position now to to use that hope and optimism to really hopefully fuel successes in 2024. Um, so with this, you've now, uh, we talked a little, we're going to chat a little bit more about state central that we talked about on, on our last episode as well. Uh, but now that you've been there for five months, you've worked with chairman Han, I'd like a little bit of your insight 
um, and to, I, I know you have a lot of uh, confidence and, and support of him in his role and his leadership uh, steering the state party. Can you chat a little bit about what you've seen from Chairman Hannon and why you're confident um, as his, him leading this state party uh, heading into this election year? Absolutely. I think the first thing to note is that before I took the job, I tried to do as much research on David Han as I could, right? Like I called people who had worked for him before. I called people who had known him. Um, and I just heard glowing reviews. And I just heard he's the best boss I've ever had. He's super ethical. He's very kind. He's very even keeled. He's very level headed. He's not reactionary. Um, he's willing to take advice. People told me that. Having a, a you know candidate or principal who's actually willing to listen to the people that they pay um, is huge. And I have not been disappointed since being there. Everything that I heard is absolutely true about him. Um, he understands the caucus side of it, having served in the Senate. Um, he understands, you know, the campaign side of it. He was the lead the year that he lost his own seat, uh, but when you know won the majority. And I think that that just goes to show how humble he is. I mean, he he truly is one of the most ethical, maybe the most ethical, quote unquote, politician um, that I have ever met. And so again, um, I took the job, did did some background, did some digging. And he he really is doing a very good job of basically leveling the party, I think, keeping us even keeled, keeping us focused on the tasks that the party is actually supposed to do. Um, nothing is ever personal. Nothing is ever a vendetta. Nothing is ever focused on anything except for what can be good for the party, what can help us win elections in 2024. Like, what is our job? What is central? What is what is the actual role here? I couldn't agree more. And. This is a chaotic time in in politics, both nationally and in this state. And Chairman Han is a very steady hand at the the wheel, which is what Republicans need right now in this state to grow and to develop. And I had the opportunity to meet Anna when we had a debate with Chairman Han and Ken Martin, and she was here. And it's been a good opportunity to get to know her and I'm very excited again to have you here and talk. But I couldn't agree more about that kind of steady hand is what the party needs right now. And then the duo of Chairman Han and Anna at the helm is just a great duo, and it's good for the party. And it's why I think we wanted to have this discussion today. Anna, there are often misconceptions and disagreements about what the role of the state party is. Could you exactly tell our listeners, because we want to break things down here, what is the exact role of the state party and about the chair and the ED and the differences between and what's the role of each of them? I think that, uh, well, I'll say this, the, the metaphor, the analogy that I always use to describe the state party, we are the highway that the candidates drive their cars on. Like it is our job to provide the infrastructure. Um, we cannot control the candidates. We cannot control the BPOUs. We cannot control anybody. So BPOU is a basic political operating unit, local so, county party units. Correct. Yep. Keep going. Thank so you so much. A lot of the time, you know, the complaints that I'll hear about the state party, and this was even before I started working there, people will say, how could the state party let this candidate say that? You know, and we have no clue what they're going to say. You know, we're finding out that they said it at the same time that you're finding out that they said it. Um, they don't vet talking points through us. Uh, they, you know, they have their own staff. They have their own campaign managers, comms directors, uh, fundraisers, PR professionals. We do not staff any of the candidates. Um, we are there to provide infrastructure and provide resources. So practically, that looks like providing data. We get all of our data through the RNC. Uh, we send that down to candidates who are endorsed or meet other you know, recommended or other qualifications. Um, also providing uh, some donor information. We can provide volunteers. Uh, we you know, coordinate through the BPOUs, all the conventions, all the endorsements, things like that. But really, we are not making the party, you know, with or without me, is not making uh, day to day determinations, right? Um, the other complaint that I hear a lot is that it's the party's job to determine all of the messaging. Well, here's my question What message can Michelle Fishbach carry that can also be carried by somebody at Eden Prairie? Like, what is that message that's going to motivate a, you know, seventh congressional district? red rural voter to turn out that is also somehow going to motivate a suburbanite, you know, in Eden Prairie to turn out. It's it's not the job of the party to be the uh, everything to everyone all the time. And I think that that's what gets confused. People it, want David to be out there, you know, recruiting every single candidate and controlling all of the messaging and, um, you know, 
basically, you know, even replacing BPOU leaders or CD leaders or activists or all these different things. And that's just not in our prerogative. You know, we kind of are the top of the grassroots organization, but we represent them as well. You know, like we, even with the uh, presidential primary, that's another good example. You know, people will say, well, who's the state party's pick? Well, we're not picking anybody. We're keeping our mouths shut on, you know, who we all might individually like until the voters decide who the nominee will be. And then we get behind that person and we support them and provide those infrastructure points to them. This is going to quickly become one of my favorite episodes. I already can tell. One of the things, Becky, you served in a staff role at the party and as obviously executive director. I served in a staff and as a party officer in the past. One of the things that people would always talk about is they think the state party is like the Republican cop of the state. And, and I would tell people that all the time that there's no Republican cop. There's no, obviously there's the chairman of the party. There's an executive director. Those are very prominent roles in the state, but they don't act like Republican cops. No. And that's one of the problems of, of one of the advantages of being with the party that I always liked. And it's why I loved working at the party was you're relevant in anything because it's the party and you can dabble and get involved in politics because politics, I think, is involved in, in largely everything. But the downside is when there's conflict and there's problems, people automatically call the party. So if they're right. upset about how a member is voting, yep. they'll call the party. If they're upset about messaging, they'll call the party. The other thing is that, and we, and I think we've talked about this before, is that on our podcast is that I think the Republican party, when it comes to elections, to use her, her highway analogy, it's, it's spot on. The candidates are just driving on the road that they've built. And so in that scenario, which is a really good example, what happened in the last election cycle was really out of the control of, of the party because the chairman of the party can't call Scott Jensen and We've discussed his messaging with Jensen. He can't call him on the phone and say, he can say, knock it off, but he doesn't have to listen to him. There's no lever that he can pull in an election cycle to take things away. And so that highway example, it's a really good visualization of how people, when they're listening to this podcast, can think about the role of the state party. It's a really good way to describe it. But I will also say is that as much as she's right about saying that there's, it's that highway, there are a lot of people who want if they're on the highway, they want people to write tickets. They want to pull them over for speeding. And that's just not the role of the state party, correct? Right. Correct. Well, um, I know that, I, you know, I'm sure you two are aware of the kerfuffle that happened up in Ottertail County, right? And so they called the party. They were having delegate issues. And David and I actually met with them. David met with them many times before I came on. But once I started, we did our two-week uh, training tour, for lack of a better word, across the state. And we met with some of the delegates in Ottertail County. Which is great. So explain that, by the way. So oh. when, you, when you came in... Yes. So when I came in, one of the things that I had been hearing from activists was that they wanted more from the party. And, you know, in my head, sometimes when people would say that, I'm thinking, well, you know, maybe that's not technically the role of the party. But I do think that it is the role of the party to equip and prepare and train and help the BPOUs, encourage them, empower them to organize their own areas, their, you know, within their own geographical area. And so David and I took two weeks and we went around the state and we did um, nine different training sessions and basically just talked to the BPOUs about how to use our data, best practices when it comes to recruiting volunteers, best practices when it comes to fundraising, uh, you know, registering voters, absentee ballots, school board elections. It was essentially a, a big to-do list of it's August right now. We've got until the end of the year. What can you do to increase the odds of winning the 2024 elections right now? And I think to your question of, well, let me finish my other thought first before I go back to your question. Uh, so we, we met with all these people in Ottertail County during this tour. So in addition to doing the trainings, we also just did a very basic sign up genius link. We did one on one half an hour slots. You know, if anybody wanted to come and talk to David and I while we were out there in their area, uh, we sat down with people, you know, more than more than welcome. So it was a really good chance to connect with some of our core grassroots leaders and then also train everybody else. But during this meeting that we had with a lot of these Otter Tail County delegates, um, you know, we heard them out and I said, look, you're alleging that something happened. Um, there are two options here, right? Number one, I can just sit here and listen to your co complaints and say, well, I'm so sorry that happened to you, whatever, you know, let's uh, hope that it doesn't happen next time. Or the Republican Party could put into our constitution or our bylaws some sort of regulations, some sort of processes that have to be followed. So for example, if you want to be a delegate, you have to, you know, follow this paper trail or take these photos or register in this place, et cetera, et cetera. And I said, how do you feel about that? And half of the delegates said, that's a great idea because we want you to come in and be the cop and police our BPOU. And the other half said, absolutely not. That is way too top down and we are a grassroots organization. And I said, well, then I can't do anything about this. There's literally nothing that we can do because I have no 
teeth. Like I have no um, enforcement provisions. Um, and again, I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but I think that people just need to remember it's not our job to, you know, settle disputes all of the time. Um, I think if, if, I mean, a lot of the time, if people would just, um, get over pettier things, I think that would help. But even, you know, endorsements or primaries or candidates or whatever. Yeah, sure. David could call Scott Jensen and say, stop saying that. But Scott Jensen got endorsed. You know, he doesn't report to David. He reports to the voters. And by the way, those are the same people that David reports to as well. Um, to your question, Michael, of what is the role of the chair and what is the role of the ED, I see the role of the chair as really three things. Number one, fundraising. That's the biggest one. Um, number two, being the face of the party with the media, <coughs> so sending quotes, doing interviews, things like that. And then third, um, there is a significant grassroots responsibility. But with the chair, um, it really comes down to where does he need to be and how can we maximize his time? Because there's 50 grassroots events going on every night, right? So just trying to figure out where to get him. Um, and then I see the role of the executive director kind of the same as a campaign manager. It's my job to keep the trains running on time. So I need to make sure that our finance plan is followed. I need to make sure that we're liaising with all of our partners properly, NRSC, NRCC, RNC, um, you know, candidates, um, making sure that our media goals are being met, making sure that we're getting press releases out, making sure that our caucus program is developed, making sure that, you know, if we're running ads or doing mailers or sending out emails, that those things actually go off without a hitch. You know, I think one, so as Michael mentioned, I um, was at the party for two years, first uh, as communications director and then went into uh, as executive director. And I think one um, issue that I see with kind of some of these misconceptions about the role of the chair or the party or the ED is that every chair has kind of done it a little bit differently. We've yes. had some chairs that are a little bit more message focused. We've had chairs that um, do things a little bit more um, top down than, than grassroots up. And, and I think that every two or four years, unlike the Democrats who have had Ken Martin there for yeah, decade plus, right. um, it, it has uh, – it, it has made it a little bit more difficult for delegates and, and activists to understand truly what the path is forward. And and so, um, you know, Michael and I talk a lot about the messaging side of, of Republican politics as a whole. And, um, and and when, you know, when I was there, we, we did not – so much focus on what Republicans should be saying, but used it as kind of a, a let's let's ding the governor, let's ding you know Democrats, and, and using it kind of as the firing squad in that way. Um, but one of my favorite things that you guys are doing right now is a lot of more of that grassroots outreach. Yes. This is something we saw you know I, in my time there. Is there while it is grassroots, while each BPOU is its own entity, there is some. Um, you, you, why recreate the wheel, right? If you have yeah. things that work and you've seen it work, being able to share that. And and I'm hopeful that there is some continual um, progression of, of these different units um, to evolve into a more well-oiled machine that can have those fundraising events every year and have those um, volunteer events and really kind of churn out the infrastructure on the local level to help support what you at the state party are doing and our candidates that are driving down the highway. So I think... Well, yeah. And, and there's so much that we can do to improve the highway, right? I'm not saying that, it, you know, it's all the fault of the candidates if they don't succeed. I mean, just helping helping the BPUs raise money, giving them best practices to recruit volunteers, giving them um, goals and tasks and things that need to be accomplished. I mean, our BPUs are all made up of volunteers, Right. They're not made up of political professionals. And so if somebody is willing to give a ton of their time to chair a BPOU or be on the board, yes, 100 percent, we can help them with ideas, with goals, with things that would help. Um, and to your to your other point about every chair doing it a little bit differently, um, I do think that I have seen, you know, from chair to chair, the grassroots are very appreciative when they are empowered and when they are encouraged and when they're allowed to run with their own ideas, but also be a team player, right? Um, I always bring up Carver County. You know, we lost that house seat in Chanhassen to Lucy Ream, 432 votes. There were over 200 people in that district that we think are Republicans who did not turn in their absentee ballots. And there are another 2,000 people in our database who we think are Republicans. And so I look at that BPOU, what does the party need to do to get them 
Um, and they're actually great BPOU. Their chair has done a lot of door knocking. So this is not at all to knock them. But you look at these BPOUs, you know, what can they do to close the gap on those 432 votes? Do you need a training on how to go and legally collect absentee ballots? Do you need a training on how to register new voters? Do you need a training on how to go and look at those 2,000 people and figure out whether or not we have them marked correctly in the database and then turn them out to vote? You know, what are the best practices to turning somebody out to vote? And because the Democrats have so much more money than us, I think that it does make our party units and our grassroots all the more important. Like, we can't pay for it, but we do have volunteers and people who are willing to work. So we desperately need them. So as every chair does it differently, we also always see, regardless of how the chairs do it, sometimes there's some pushback, yes. right? There are some folks from whether it's one VPOU or, or or multiple that dislike how a current chair is running, which it's America. This is a great thing about uh, about our systems is you can voice your opposition and, and act accordingly, I guess. Um, we did talk a little bit about uh, in last week's episode about State Central and the attempt, a uh, disastrously failed attempt, we'll maybe say, to to take down Chair Han and, and you know, uh, overthrow his, the remainder of his term. Uh, from an insider point of view, can you explain a little bit about what happened um, and and how you guys worked through that? We we especially both really appreciated Han bringing that, at, adding that motion to the agenda so that it could be yep. discussed and fought out and how it needed to. But from what happened from your perspective? Well, let's back up to August. So all of the state central delegates are constitutionally tasked with overseeing the party. And so it is well within their right to ask questions, to, uh, you know, look at financial information, to raise concerns about things that are going on. That is their responsibility, not only their right, their responsibility. So there are provisions in our constitution for getting rid of a chair, uh, because sometimes you have bad chairs and you do have to get rid of people. I would argue that David is not one of those people. Uh, but in the constitution, if you are not going to have something added to the agenda at a meeting, you can actually call a meeting. You need, I think, 75 or 80 delegates uh, to basically sign on, and they have to be from three different congressional districts, and they can say, we want a special meeting for this purpose, uh, chair, deputy chair, another party officer, whatever it may be. So af at the August state central meeting, somebody made a motion from the floor um, to add uh, the removal of the chair to the agenda. And it was ruled out of order because our Constitution says if you want to remove a chair, it has to uh, uh, be a proposal with a you know detailed list of the charges against them. That proposal has to be brought by a body or a committee. And it has to go out with a meeting notice uh, 10 days in advance of the meeting. And so it was ruled out of order. So shortly after that meeting, several delegates, probably half a dozen, requested the state central list. And we gave them the list right away. A lot of previous chairs have not done that. We gave them everyone's names. We gave them addresses. We gave them emails, home phones, mobile phones, um, which uh, unfortunately was not respected later on when I get to my story four months down the road. Um, but we gave people all of that info. And so in August, there were petitions that were circulated in accordance with the list agreement saying, I want to remove David for these reasons. Please sign on to my petition. And I never received a petition at the party, which means that there were not 75 people in the party who wanted to get rid of David. So um, time goes by. We send out the call for the meeting. Uh, it was two weeks ahead of December 5th, which was when we were closing registration. We closed it a couple days before just so we could get all of our ducks in a row, print name tags, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and after we sent out the call, I think it was a couple days later, um, David and Donna and Barb get these envelopes delivered to their houses. Which, real quick, that's the chair, deputy chair, and RNC committee woman, correct? Correct. They get these envelopes delivered to their houses, and it just says, you know, proposal for removal of the chair from state central delegates and alternates, but they weren't signed. There was no name on it. There's absolutely nothing, uh, which, again, was it a body or a committee like the Constitution says? Was it one delegate? What was it? And so the uh, state exec board ended up meeting to discuss this. They decided that, you know, we should follow our party constitution. Um, one of the things talked about at the meeting was that these charges were anonymous. Um, Jenna Dix, who's the secretary, and Alex Pleckish, um, there had also been a lot of complaints about them, and they had also been anonymously served with these charges. Well, after the state exec board pointed out that the charges were anonymous, um, one of the delegates uh, suddenly just took credit for them. And he said, this is absurd. The state exec board is lying. It's obvious that this stuff was written up by me. Well, his name was never on it, right? So that kind of kicked off, uh, you know, right after Thanksgiving, some of the more 
uh, some of the contention, I'll say. Um, but there were a lot of emails that went around, which, again, were not in accordance with our list agreement. There was anonymous mail sent out. Um, one of the pieces came from a zip code where no delegate had requested the list. So that means that a delegate either violated the list agreement by giving it to somebody in that zip code or they just mailed it from that zip code. Um, again, there's only 349 state central delegates. What If you are if you want to remove the chair, stand up and say it. You know, be proud of it. Have a good reason. Um, it, it just, it was... It was all very, very um, and unconstitutional. I'll just say that. So we get to the meeting, um, and David made the motion to put it on the agenda. The person who was chairing the meeting, Dave Osmick, he said, you know, I really don't think this should be on the agenda. It doesn't seem constitutional, given that it was an anonymous proposal, uh, not by a body or a committee, and it didn't go out with the meeting notice. Um, well, the, the person kind of heading up this effort had previously told a couple of the news outlets that he had 100 delegates and alternates who had signed on to something saying that they wanted to remove David. Um, and my reaction to hearing that was, okay, well, if you have those people, get them on a list and put it on my desk, because at that point, the party would have been forced to call a special meeting or call a vote or put this on the agenda. That's the most effective way. Uh, well, David called for the vote at the meeting. I think it was 5.48 p.m. We had like 12 minutes left. And so uh, the, the final motion ended up being all in favor of removing David Hanna's chair. You know, please stand. And the tellers went around and counted. And there were 96 people who voted against him, which is 27 percent. You need basically the reverse percentage of that. Mm -hmm. You need two thirds of people, not less than one third, to remove a chair. Um, and so that was that. They People had their say. And... Again, state central delegates do have a responsibility to oversee the party. Um, but I would also argue that part of that is not harming the party, right? Like part of that is realizing if you don't have two thirds of, of the delegates to sign on to this, why would you cause this type of chaos and contention? Why would you send out press releases and make us look bad in the media? Um, the only stories that the media is guaranteed to cover is Republican and Republican violence. And so anytime that you go to the media with a, a you know, saying that there is this huge problem or there's a, a bloodbath or something like that, of course they're going to cover it. And so then, you know, the party is being badgered by reporters for a couple of weeks saying, what's going on? Is David unpopular or whatever? And I just said, look, we have these procedures and there are not 75 delegates willing to sign on. There aren't. They haven't hit my desk. Um, you know, we can let you know if they do. But at this point, it's just a lot of chaos. It's a lot of contention. And it's just making the entire party look bad. Right. And this is something that I think Republicans have struggled with, especially in our state. Um, but of course, you know, we watched it in Congress, the speaker debacle that went down, that the Republican on Republican violence is uh, when it comes to violence with words, I should say, is is something that's not new and something that unfortunately or fortunately for them, I guess, the Democrats really have figured out they keep a lot of their fighting behind closed doors and um, maybe not so much lately, but uh, they, they tend to do a little bit better. So one of the things when we talked about this a little bit last week is the goal, the need for Republicans to move on, to move forward, united, um, coalesce behind Chairman Han and and work towards a successful 2024. Um, I would like to say I'm cautiously optimistic, but uh, I'm not sure. Where do you stand on that? Or do you think that whether it's those individuals, are they going to support Chairman Han? Or if they're not even willing to do that, do you believe they will let that go and just focus on their local candidates and just remove any arrows they currently have pointing at the chairman? Or do you think this is going to be something that continues forward? I think that when David has to be reelected in December, another challenge might come up. But again, we have these constitutional provisions. And one of the things that uh, these people who wanted to remove David were complaining about was that he didn't follow the Constitution. So it's pretty hypocritical to say, you know, we're going to try to circumvent the Constitution or we're going to try to have a unconstitutional state central meeting. Um, there is so much work to do. I mean, in every single BPOU, Ryan Wilson lost by 8,000 and some votes, right? Every single BPOU could have turned out more people. There is just so much to do. And so with all of the chatter that I've seen online in the past, what has it been now? Two weeks? One week? Something like that? Um, I haven't seen any plans or heard of anybody calling for another meeting or anything like that. Um, obviously, there are you know people, some of the 96, who are still unhappy. Um, but at the end of the day, 2024 is literally weeks away. And 
Um, it's not 100% David's fault if we win or lose, right? Every single person, every single candidate party unit has a role to play in that. And so um, from my end, you know, and from David's end, the party has basically just been putting out the message, you know, we want to work with everybody, even if you are one of the 96. Um, again, we get it. You don't like David. Let's agree to disagree and let's get to work. Let's register new movers. Let's find absentee voters. Um, with caucuses coming up, you know, every BPOU should make a list of high schools in their area and go and talk to high schoolers about how to caucus and that the Republican Party is an option. Um, the the absentee um, balloting uh, season for the presidential primary opens in January. That's only a couple weeks away. Make a list of every single nursing home in your area and go and add people to the permanent absentee ballot list. You know, those are all important things to do. And I think in the grand scheme of things, they matter way more than who the chair of the party is. Way more. And one of the things that I think Becky and I know, but I think you're experiencing right now, is that on any given day, roughly 30 to 40 percent of the activists don't like who the chair is because they're just the chair. It happens in both parties. What was, I think, frustrating or surprising or challenging, I think, for you, but just in discussion about this, was just the intensity by which they, I mean, they were sending out press releases, they were doing all this stuff. It just serves as a huge distraction to the party when they're trying to rebuild. And it's counterproductive to the goal. And it's also a little bit of a, a little bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy. They're frustrated with the dynamics of the party. So they waste the party's time for a couple of weeks, if not longer, right. creating problems, getting the party off task, which only reinforces their narrative even more, right. which is just ridiculous. The other point I'd make is that you can see a little bit of the dynamic that it's how difficult it is to be a party chair. Because in one instance, you can't be a Republican cop. The party believes in local control. But simultaneously, what people generally want the party to do is to weigh in on local affairs and right. get involved and act like some tribunal of Republicans dispute. And it's just, it's not what the role of the party is. It's just not the role of the party. Well, and it's ironic, too, because there was, uh, I mean, me. just anecdotal examples here, but there was one person who was mad at me that I hadn't responded to their email sooner about data access. Now, this is one of the people who was standing up on Saturday voting against David. Um, and who had kind of helped plan this stuff. And I said, well, I can't respond to your emails about data access when I now have a, you know, meeting coming up in a few days and I have to respond to the press and they're on a three hour <laughs> deadline and all these other things to do. Um, the other thing that I hear complaints about is that David isn't um, fundraising enough. Well, guess what? All of his donor meetings were about over the past couple of weeks before State Central. Um, are you staying after December 9th? Are you leaving? Why should we give you money if 75 people can just call a meeting and overthrow you? Um, why would I want to give money to a party that's being bloodied in the press? We look like idiots. You know, why do I want to be a part of that? And it, it really is damaging. So in that sense, yes, it is a self-fulfilling prophecy. The, the other problem, though, that I think is just as big, um, this goes back to my earlier comment about the Republican Party being a volunteer organization. People do not want to sacrifice their time to just engage in fights. And so, so many of the calls that I got in the couple weeks leading up were just nice, kind, normal Minnesota Republican volunteers saying, what incarnation is going on? Is there any truth to any of this? And why am I doing this? You know, why am I trying to manage these, these personality conflicts in my BPOU? Why are we trying to have this giant fight on Saturday when we know that the votes aren't even there? Like, it just... It, it drags people down, and given the losses that we've had, it just, it doesn't help anyone. It just, it burns energy. It burns time. It's a, it's a, a mentality suck. Yes, and it's one of the best ways of, and we said it on the podcast last week, it's the best, one of the best examples in recent times of how the party activists can sometimes put the anchor around their own neck and help the efforts and weigh the party's efforts down. Republican Party lost races as you articulated that they should have won last year and they were in they're much closer than they lost some races in a very close way they lost a couple statewide races very close and and you flip a few hundred votes the dynamics of the house and the senate are fundamentally different and we're talking about a different framework of public policy all throughout the state we would have that check and balance in this system and so i think that the there are just a number of activists inside the party and they will come and go what I think was, I think what's so important about, I think, doing this episode, as two Republicans, you and I, Ricky, that want the, the party to succeed, this stuff needs to be called out a little bit and how much of a distraction it is and how much it is. There's just only so much bandwidth that the party has to deal with problems. And when you're taking time away, worrying about these bureaucratic issues that make no sense, it's just surprising how much people are willing to do in these kind of time burglar type moments and just take time away from people because... Every time Chairman Han or the party, I assume, 
-hmm. every time you were spent, there's only 24 hours in the day. Correct. And I guarantee you working as an ED or working as a party chair ain't an eight to five job. And so of those time, of that time leading up, what should be done in a nor this time of year is chasing donation checks, getting, doing a big fundraising push, getting all those year end checks in because the calendar restarts in, in a couple of weeks and getting ready and laying the groundwork for what's coming up in 2024. But what the party had to spend their time on was this internal dust up that was never going to go anywhere. I think Chairman Han, and I've known him for a long time, I think it was pretty remarkable for him to stare it down and say, let's just vote this up and down. I'd like, I was, an, I was a party officer. I don't know that I would have done that because in you can look at it two ways. In one way, he's validating this kind of fringe element but in the same way, he's just like also pushing it aside and saying, look, we have to move on. And when I heard about it happening, I wasn't there that day, but when I heard about it happening, it was a pretty, pretty aggressive move. And he stared it down and it's time to move on. I will say that I think that there's a couple folks that are still percolating around, but I think the vast majority of people, I think, got the message that they want the party to succeed and they want it to move forward. And I right. hope that they do because... The party has a real opportunity in 2024, yep. a real opportunity. Yeah, and people keep on saying, you know, the party under David Hand suffered the worst losses ever. Um, no, we didn't. We lost two statewide races by less than a point. The last time that that happened was, I think, with Emmer um, over a decade ago. So we are making progress. Um, to your point, Michael, with the David calling for the vote on, on his own removal, one of the things that people kept on saying was that he's not accountable and he's not transparent. And I think the fact that he was willing to do that just kills that argument um, because I don't know what more accountability you can have than saying, do you want to keep me or not? I mean, that's kind of uh, the crux of it. Absolutely. Before we get into 2024 and what's to come, um, I just was curious from, from what Michael and I had seen and heard, um, there wasn't, but was did this group did they have somebody waiting in the wings if they were successful to take John Han or was this just a pipe dream of let's overthrow the chair and we'll figure it out at that time comes so during the meeting uh somebody one of the delegates did pass around a list of people who they wanted to be chair but they didn't actually talk to any of the people on the list about whether or not they wanted <laughs> to be chair and I was told even back in August um we sat down with a couple of people when we did our our one-on-ones within that training tour and they said, well, you know, David, you just need to quit. And then somebody will rise to the occasion. And I said, OK, so you're going to get rid of David. You're going to get rid of Donna, Barb, everybody else, um, you know, the staff. Like, you just want to clean it out. Um, I said, what's going to happen on Monday morning at 8 a.m.? And they said, well, you can stay. And I said, well, thank you. That's very <laughs> generous. Uh, what am I going to do on Monday morning at 8 a.m.? What am I going to tell people? And the answer that I heard from those people, the answer that I've heard over the past couple of months is just somebody will rise to the occasion. You know, you have to get rid of the, the problem and then something else will pop up. But again, with a couple of months until the new year, it, it's just not realistic in any way shape or form well, so have, no there was there was nobody what would have happened if the chairman had been removed is that the party would have done nothing for 60 to 90 days there would have been largely no money coming into the party or the operations would have ceased then you would have had to recalibrate it for so for 60 to 90 days leading into into the end of december rest of january and probably a good portion of february and march that's the time when the party is in there that's game day for them you got precinct caucuses coming up, which the subject we'll get into next and in, in, in the presidential uh, process that's going on. But removing Han or removing any party officer at that time without a smooth, quick transition is incredibly short-sighted and problematic. And I also think the fact that they didn't have anyone identified shows that this wasn't much of a movement. This was, by all accounts, a, a few activists that had some gripes about some uh, the bureaucracy of the party. But no one was willing to stand up and lead and take the party, take the reins on. And I think that was evident by the fact that no one stepped forward, but that they didn't have anyone willing to do that. And that's just the frustrations. And it's just unfortunate. I'm glad that we broke it down here and discussed it because I think that we've spent a lot of time talking about messaging and party operations. But I hope this episode puts into context the type of internal disagreements that the chairman of the party and Anna have had to deal with and helps realize that the successes and the position that they're in is pretty remarkable despite what you guys are dealing with. Well, and I've talked to several people too, you know, um, 
you know, who I think, you know, after David is done with his term or whatever, just who would be great chairs, right? Or people have said, you know, you should talk to so-and-so or, you know, say that David would have gone down. You know, people have this list of names. And I've said a few of the people on the list, you know, oh, so do you want to be party chair? Nobody wants to do it because it is such a hard job. And so thankless. And very thankless. I mean, poor David. Like, my goodness, he works probably 80 hours a week. He's traveling all over the state. He's dealing with, you know, all the, you know, anonymous things being delivered to his house. And it's just, it's very disrupting. Um, and so I guess my point is when we do these types of internal conflicts, you're actually uh, uh, pushing away potential chairs. Nobody wants to deal with it, right? Nobody wants to deal with the nastiness. Um, and by the way, according to our constitution, you can call a special convention or a special meeting to remove the chair at any point in time. So if people really were that unhappy with David, if the majority of the people really were that unhappy, they could have presented a challenger in December last year when he was reelected, or at any point in time this past year, they could have called a special meeting and found a new candidate to replace the chair. That is well within the constitution, but they didn't. They didn't. They wanted to do it now, which again, harms the party. That is not in the best interest of the party. Do you think that was the objective? Was It was not, do you think that th the objective was to harm the party or do you think it was to actually remove him? I think that there are some people whose objective is to harm the party. I don't think that was the majority of the 96 people who stood up. I do think that they wanted to remove him. Um, but again, I mean, what are you getting if he's gone? You have 45 days to, to plan another meeting. Um, then that person has to come in. They have to reacclimate. They have to meet everybody. They have to hire their own staff. Um, I, I guess I'll just say, you know, if I were a Democrat and I wanted to wreak havoc in the Republican Party, this is exactly what I would do. Like, it's a great path to just internal combustion. So call David a rhino. But if you're hurting the party, I mean, I, that's that's what the Democrats do. Let's do the math for a second. You were there that day. So yes. um, what was the voting total that day? 348. So there was 348 people. And, and so 96 voted against. So, but the chairman went and said he wanted this added to the resol added this to the agenda. Correct. And what was the vote total on that? It was 184 votes, which is 10 votes over the 50% majority required threshold. Which what we talked about, Becky, which on the last episode, we brought up the fact that roughly 184, yes. 184, I think I might have said 185, but roughly 184, 185 people voted to put the item on the agenda at chairman's hands request. Yep. So there were people that, but then the vote to remove him was only 96. Mm -hmm. So the number dropped. So the people, the vast the majority of the activists yep. supported it being on there, but well below the threshold. What would they have needed to get rid of him? Uh, two thirds. So, Which would have been, well, I think I saw two. thirds two, of 348 is, I, I'm not good at mental math. Somebody can calculate, calculate I was, that out. I but think I think it's, it's like 240. 230. 230. 230. Yeah, so roughly 230 ish was needed. So yep. this was a very unsuccessful coup attempt. Yep. Right. Right. And somebody at the meeting actually got up and spoke against even adding it to the agenda. Um, and that person made the point that, you know, by the time that it's a chair's second term, 20% of the activists are going to dislike them. <laughs> And when the vote came out to 27, I think that uh, that activist was just, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, he was right. He knew he called it. Oh, that's right. Because not only did you have the 185 that voted to put it on, but you also had the people that voted against it. Correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it was a double whammy. Let's talk about some positive stuff coming into 2024. Precinct caucuses. Yes. And the presidential race. Oh, boy. Yes. And the presidential race. Give us where the party's going. What should we know coming into 2024? So um, if I dare say so myself, the party actually did a great job um, getting out the caucus stuff this year. I had a lot of help from a lot of really good people who've been doing this for a very long time, who, like you said, Becky, did not force us to reinvent the wheel. Um, and so at the state central meeting, we actually handed out caucus packets to everybody with all of their materials. Uh, we have everything up on the website. Um, our goal is to get all the locations nailed down here in the next couple of weeks. And then according to state statute, you have to have all of your conveners by uh, February, like early February. So we're working really hard on that. Um, and we're not going to have, you know, a presidential poll or anything like that at caucuses. But it will be really, really important for delegates who want to go on to uh, the CD2 race, the CD3 race with Dean being gone, uh, you know, local legislative races um, or the U.S. Senate race. So we're working on that, trying to just streamline everything and cut down on paper and make things very, very easy for new people. We're trying to bring people into the party, right? Like politics is a game of addition. We always want to be bringing new people in not having them come to their first, you know, state central and having a, a screaming match, right? That doesn't help us. That doesn't help us get votes or win elections. 
So to set the table a little bit too, um, uh, caucuses have changed a little bit now with the introduction of the presidential primary, but they are super important to party business being yes. conducted. And it is a very heavy lift for the state party. I, I've been through it. I know how wild it can be um, having to navigate working with hundred hundreds of, of different locations and making sure they have their script, their sign-up forms. They have everything that they need for their delegate and alternate election, which is different based on the different BPO used. And it's a really, really heavy lift. And I, I'm sure some of the folks uh, will chat offline of, of some of those folks you worked with that I'm sure it's the same ones I did who are extremely helpful and give hours and hours and hours of their time to make sure that these caucuses are successful. So, um, But walk through a little bit of some of that business that is done. So if somebody is listening who maybe hasn't participated in a precinct caucus before, um, where they can, once locations are set, where they can find that, and also what they could expect uh, for business that is being conducted. Yes. So uh, February 27th, legally, I believe we have to start at 7 p.m. and get done with the elections by 8 p.m. Um, there are 4,000 precincts across the state. Um, they each have to have a convener and have their own uh, little, you know, caucus within within their, you know, BPOU or, or Sun District or LD or uh, County Caucus. Um, you can find your caucus location on the Secretary of State's website. Those are are posted early February. If you just go to the pollfinder.mn.sos. Uh, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. gov. Um, we'll put a link in the yeah, uh, in yeah. the show. Punch it in to you know just find my polling place. Um, but basically, you go, you check in, you uh, you share your information. They make sure that you are actually an eligible eligible voter and that you live in that precinct. Um, and then the business is essentially um, electing a chair, a secretary for the caucus, and then they elect a precinct chair and sometimes precinct vice chairs. Those are people who are supposed to, in the upcoming two years, take responsibility for organizing their precinct. And actually, when I worked in Kansas, this is a bit off topic, but if you'll let me go down a rabbit hole for a of minute. Of course. Um, in most states where they have primaries, the precinct committee man and woman are actually publicly elected on the primary ballot. So in Kansas, when you went in August, the first Tuesday in August, to vote for your primary candidate, like Congress, House, State Senate, all that stuff, you also voted for the precinct committee man and the precinct committee woman. And I realized when I got down there right away, their precinct people are so much more involved because they actually have to face an election every two years if they want their position. And so it is not uncommon for precinct people down there to literally knock their entire precinct, knock every Republican door in their precinct. And then what they do is they take literature for their candidates, but then they also take something that says, you know, vote for me, Michael Broadcorp, to be the committee man for, you know, precinct X in, in this ward. Um, and so there is a lot more accountability with the, the public balloting um, in primary states. Now, um, at our caucuses, that hasn't been the main focus. The main focus has really been just the presidential straw poll. Um, and I think that now that that's done, we have a chance to kind of re-engage and really show people, you know, part of that packet that we printed off, you know, examples of things that you can do as a precinct chair, um, responsibilities, um, at, you know, resources that are available to you to help you out with this stuff. So anyways, so electing that leader who's supposed to really organize the precinct for the next um, couple of years. We also elect delegates and alternates who then go on to the BPOU conventions in March and April to vote for the next uh, candidates. Um, and then we also have a process to go through resolutions. If you have an idea or a change that you want to make to the bylaws or the Constitution, um, you can fill out a resolutions form and submit that on caucus night. And then the caucus will actually vote that up or down to move on to the next stage of the process. Um, but I've talked to the RNC about this at length. I think that Minnesota, actually, I know, I'm very confident, we have the most intricate and in-depth grassroots system in the country. And so when people say, I hate David, or I hate the way that the Republican Party is in Minnesota, or we're swampy or whatever, no, we are literally the most grassroots party. And that comes with some challenges, but it also comes with a lot of opportunities. So I think everybody should caucus. You know, if you're a, a Republican who has any interest in winning elections, show up at your caucus. It's literally one hour, um, and you can run to be a delegate or an alternate and be one of the couple hundred people who influences who your representative is. I mean, that's crazy to think about, that our congressional members are voted up or down by 300 people. That is a lot of power, way more than if you voted in a primary. So a little bit of history. I first was a, I first got involved in the party as a caucus convener. Duluth, 1994, 
I was, there was a need for someone to convene the caucus where I was going to school up at UMD. Uh, I decided to not go on spring break, which did not make my girlfriend in college at the time very happy. But I stayed home, did not go on spring break, stayed up in Duluth and convened my caucus and went door to door, talked to people, was up there the whole week. And it was a total nerd fest, not as big as some of the nerd fest that you've participated in, but it was a lot of fun to do. And it was the, my first kind of foray into party politics. I was a, I convened a caucus in, I think it was in March of 94 up in Duluth. That was my first thing. And so it's a great gig. You, imagine the places you can go if you convene your caucus once. Uh, Anna, were you born in 1994? I was born in 1997. Ooh. Ooh. Sorry, I just had to make you feel a little old there. Were you born in 94? Yeah, I was born in 86. I'm old. Jeez. <laughs> I just had to make you feel bad there. Appreciate we, that, thanks. We try to make it as easy as possible for the conveners. I mean, we literally print out a script. You do? And we put in, you know, big, bold, italicized letters. You know, it's 16 or 14 point font, so everybody yeah. can read it. Um, but we tell you exactly what to say. We tell you exactly what to do. We have in big red letters where if you need to record the time or record a vote or something like that. Um, and we, I mean, literally everything is in your packet. So it's not hard. Um, the BPO use are well underway to recruiting their 4,000 conveners. But yeah, if you're interested in being a convener, as long as you can read, it's really not that hard. And there it, you go. You, you can't do it then. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. <laughs> wow. Uh, but it is also just a really great way to get within like-minded individuals in your community to meet your neighbors um, because it is such a, a local level organization. Yes. And we spoke on this a little bit. Um, I'm going to take Michael's question from him. Um, but there is this evolution with how things are conducted because of the presidential primary, which we are going into our second year of a presidential primary. Explain a little bit about how that came to be. I know you introduced your list. Uh, or the, the state party um, is tasked with giving a list of candidates to the secretary of state. I understand yes. that um, that list was sent over in the last couple of weeks. But if explain a little bit about what this has changed for the process and uh, how that list came to be. So a couple of years ago, 2019, 2020, 2018, I don't remember exactly, the state legislature voted that we would no longer be doing the presidential uh, preference poll at caucuses. And I think that the reasoning for that um, was that it just got to be so crazy. When you have, you know, these 4,000 different units and you're um, having volunteers convene them, it does get to be hard. Um, I think that the Democrats uh, may have wanted to move towards this because the presidential primary is a great opportunity for voter ID. Um, but either way, there were uh, pros and cons to doing it at caucus. There are pros and cons to doing a primary. But we have a primary now, so that's what we deal with. Um, in 2020, there were over 100,000 Republicans who voted in the or voted with a Republican ballot. And I think that there were over 700,000 Democrats who voted. Um, granted, they didn't have as much of a challenge because Joe Biden, I mean, obviously there were other candidates on the ballot, but I think we all kind of knew that it was going to be Biden, right? Um, on our ballot, though, it was basically only Donald Trump. And so very few Republicans turned out. This year is really the first real opportunity that we have to get good IDs on Republican voters. Um, and the reason for that being after the primary, the Secretary of State will give to the major parties a list of everybody who identified with their party. So going back to my Carver County example with Chanhassen, you know, um, we have 2,000 voters there who we think are Republicans. And one of the complaints that I hear often from activists, candidates, donors, literally everybody, as they say, our data in Minnesota is so bad and other states don't struggle with this. Why is it a problem that we have? And the reality is that unlike other states, we do not have party registration. And so the only way that we can figure out if you're a Democrat or a Republican is either A, you tell us, as in we go knock on your door, we call you, we text you, you know, we send you some sort of a survey on Facebook to fill out with your info, whatever. Um, or if we pay a bunch of money and basically, you know, buy credit card data or we, you know, look at your age and your gender and the location where you live and, uh, you know, who you donate to and, and things like that and try to calculate what your party affiliation is. But a lot of the time that's wrong, right? Like, uh, you know, both um, you and I, Becky, like we, you know, according to the calculations, we should be hard Democrats, but we're not. So there's always outliers. Um, with this, we will know exactly who says that they're a Republican or not. And how somebody votes in the primary is a pretty good indication of how they'll vote in the general. And so then... Real quick, to be clear, 
we're not going to, the party doesn't find out who on the Correct. Republican ballot you voted for, just if you voted yes. in a Republican ballot or a Democrat yes. ballot. Yes, we find out that you pulled a Republican ballot. So the same way that they record who votes, they'll record what type of ballot you got. And then you obviously go to the ballot box, you secretly, you know, check your candidate, and then you you turn it in and nobody sees that. Um, what we can do then with that data is we'll figure out who all those Republican voters are, and then we can give that list to our candidates and we can say, spend money on these people or do not spend money on these people, right? Uh, when you don't have hard ideas on people, you can waste a lot of money as a candidate. Because again, um, you know, Becky, if you look like a, a hard Democrat or a soft Democrat, and, you know, Tim Walls is spending money to mail you and text you and have somebody knock on your door, that's a completely futile effort. You're never going to vote Democrat, right? You're just not. And so we don't want our candidates doing that. We want them to have good IDs. And the good news about this is literally it doesn't matter who votes, right? It's just a presidential primary. So encourage all of your Democrat friends. Encourage people who you're not quite sure where they're at. Um, get everybody to turn out and vote and get familiar with where their polling place is. Make sure that they're registered. It's just a good trial run before November. To your point about finalizing our ballot, we did finalize our ballot last week. Um, the criteria that we used was basically the RNC's criteria. So I think the final five are um, Nikki DeSantis, Chris Christie, Vivek, and Donald Trump. So that's who'll be on the ballot. Fantastic. And so that is early March. March 5th. It's one week after caucuses. Busy time. Very. I think it's a good point to, rem to remind people is that we have as how confusing the system is in Minnesota. We have caucuses, we have primaries. We also want an endorsement state, but the endorsement yes. is not legally binding. Correct. In some states, the endorsement is legally binding. In some states, they don't endorse if they have a primary. So Minnesota has all of these options, Yes. which is another reason why it's so important that we have a steady hand at the till, uh -huh. and we have good top staff like we have with Anna at the party to help navigate this mess. Which I think also just goes back to our the earlier conversation about how disruptive this recent attempt yes. uh, with Chair Han was because it, it literally here happening mid-December. Now we're, you know, going into caucus and then it's the presidential primary and then it's BPOU um, conventions and then it's CD conventions and then May is going to be a state convention all before an August primary. I mean, yep. it is just insane the amount of work that the party has to do just logistically yep. to keep the ball rolling towards electing um, delegates at all levels, endorsing candidates, and and getting to a successful primary and then general election. So um, really excited that uh, you obviously have the passion, have the hope, have the optimism to be there and to support Chair Han. Um, and we're really hopeful to see what, what comes and uh, hopefully a bright blustery um, bright and and busy party operations good activists good volunteers um, and and where can people find more if they want to get involved or follow what the party is doing find events that sort of thing mngop.org or you can email us info at mngop.com um, or you can call us 651-222-0022. Your, your Twitter account. Correct. Your personally. ex account. Oh, my ex account handle. Yes. Anna E. Matthews with one T. Great. One word. And last thing, uh, candidate recruitment. Candidate recruitment. I literally just talked to a candidate on my way over here, and I knew that you were going to ask me about <laughs> that, but I can't say anything until things are finalized. But there are so many people who have been motivated to run by all of the crazy things that the Democrats have done. Um, and a lot of people who, by the way, are not typical conservatives uh like they are conservatives they vote republican but they're not like the you know traditional establishment conservatives so if the democrats are losing the middle people that's really bad for them really really bad fantastic that's what we like to see we hope to hear more and um it's going to be a wild and crazy year that's for sure yes but we have so many opportunities 0.34 percent if, if every republican would just put that like on their mirror, like write it in lipstick when you wake up every single day, 0.34%. That's what we have to do. Michael's uh, making a weird face. I don't have lipstick, so. He's not a girl. <laughs> he doesn't write things on Anna's mirror in lipstick. Yes. It's a thing. Yeah. Um, well, I want to thank you for being here. And we thank hope we can have me. you back because this has been great. This is going to be one of my favorite episodes. Uh, and for the political nerds out there, this is it. I mean, this is this is the episode. This is how the sausage is made. So yeah. it's not always exciting to to see or hear, but it's super important. And yep. um, we've both been involved in in some levels of that. And, and so we're appreciative of all your work. And 
good luck. 2024 is going to be long and crazy, but we're, we're, we're standing by. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you for being here. Thanks, <laughs> What's the heck? I don't know. You're just like a, what's the, you're a sound effects machine today. Sure. Okay. I don't know that it's polite to say, but so Becky, we just interviewed Anna Matthews, the executive director of the MNGOP. Your take. Um, I will say I had a little bit of some flashbacks to my time prepping for precinct caucuses, uh, because man, that is not a super fun job. But no, I, I'm very impressed. I think Anna is a, has a good head on our shoulders, is very passionate and ready to hit the ground running. And I think the combination of her with Chair Han and some of the other folks that um, are at the state party or other party officers, uh, I have I have more confidence than I did yesterday going into 2024. I do too. I think that the opportunity to meet her when she was here for, that was a couple months ago we did that interview with. Chairman Han and Ken Martin, that mm-hmm. debate. And I think she's great. I think one of the knocks right now we're hearing on Republicans in this state that there's just, there's not a lot of things, to, reasons to believe that there's opportunities here. I think she embodies that opportunity. She's a great ED, great mm-hmm. resume, great, back, great background. I don't think she would want to be working in this state if there wasn't an opportunity to win. What would be the interest in having to be the ED on a sinking ship? And so I really liked your optimism. I liked her energy, her focus, and her, I think it's also good right now that there's someone in that position who can push back a little bit on some of this misinformation and some of the things that are out there. I think it was important that she came on and addressed what happened at last week's state central meeting. That was a real, and we both have experience inside the party, and that was really, you know, BS what happened Mm -hmm. and the way it happened. And for her to come on and talk about it and explain it and really put into kind of real terms what it means for Republicans that want to succeed in this state, I think was really important that she did. I'm glad we had the opportunity to speak with her and we should have, we'll have her back on in other, on other topics to come back. And it's great to have her at the party. I think it's, I think Republicans who want Republicans to win in this state. And I said that very specifically Republicans who want Republicans to win in this state should feel very good about the fact who is filling that role right now as executive director. And I was really impressed by the interview. I'm glad we had the opportunity to speak with her. Same. And lots of good things coming up. Caucus primary. We're excited to have more conversations about that with Anna and other others as we move forward. So uh, I will try to be a little bit more optimistic going forward. Like she said, you know, it is a good reminder of how close we came in a lot of local seats, uh, legislative seats. And, um, you know, turning out those Republicans in in 2024 is going to be the decision maker. And so um, let's do it. Here's something you should be optimistic about. Oh, man, here we go. What am I talking about? Football. Here, football. We're talking about our Pick'em's League. I didn't, it wasn't what I was going to talk about, but you must have wanted to talk about it. So go right ahead. All right. Go right ahead. Talk about Pick'em League. Hey, I am up over you two two games this week. I am still down by eight. So in in what do we got? Two, three weeks here uh, left that uh, I've got a lot to make up for. But as of today, I am... Gaining two points. We'll see what happens tonight if if that turns to three or one or stays the same. But, um, you know, I, I, I'm not going to pretend like I think I'm going to overtake you, but baby steps. As of right now, I am one game out of first behind Spencer. Congratulations. You are. Quite a few. You are. Nine. You are eight behind me right now. Yeah. So mathematically. There are, we're in week 15 right now. There's three more games left. The Vikings play two against De- two against Detroit, one against Green Bay. There's three more games left. You have three options. So you have to do the math on that. You have to make up. I need to really have a challenge pr- accepted. A challenge accepted. Yes. So Here we you, go. you have to be there. The other thing you have to worry about is that Zipco is coming up right behind I you. Know, man. There's a real possibility. I mean, I don't think that I'm going to be knocked off the podium. I don't think you're going to pick up your nine out of first place. Yeah. Right. Nine out of first place. You have to pick up nine games to be in first place. But your real challenge is you got someone right in the rearview mirror there. 
I'm going to hope to to stay on the podium, to remain in third, and uh, I'll take that as my pride and joy. Should we do some type of, once football's over with, what kind of, con- what type of fighting should we be competitive about? Is something more up in your speed? No, okay. <laughs> Checkers? <laughs> sure. Um, what's something? I don't know. I'm going to think about it, man. We can do coloring contests? Sure. Okay. I know how to stay in the lines. I have the, yeah. Do you, know, do you know, by the way, speaking of that, do you know they make coloring paper cartoons that that they automatically, the, with, the, with the markers, mm, that the pictures, yeah. you can't go outside the lines of them? Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, um, one last topic uh, before we wrap up. It's birthday week. It is birthday week. It's very exciting. Any big plans? It is my birthday week. I just remember, yes, it is. I'm going to be 50 on Saturday. Big day. A couple of things I'm excited about. Uh, this is my last few days in the decade of the 40s. Uh, on Saturday, I will be able to join up for AARP. Woo! Can you believe that? No. Uh, I'm really excited about it. So, no, I'm looking forward to it, uh, being in that new age bracket or in that new decade, and I look forward to being 50s. I'm going to go in style. I'm really excited about it. So thank you for acknowledging that, and uh, I'm looking forward to it. Next time we talk, when we, the next episode comes out, I'll be in the next decade. Very exciting. Happy birthday. Thank you so much. We want to thank you for listening to The Breakdown with Brock Cobb and Becky. Before we go, show some love for your favorite podcast by leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts or on the platform where you listen. You can leave a review or give us a shout out on our website or across all social media platforms at at BBBreakPod. The Breakdown with Brock Cobb and Becky will return next week. Thank you again for listening.